Hi folks, welcome to the Gred Turin YouTube channel. This is uh, my small personal channel. I am not a professional YouTuber. I just do videos for funsies on the side. I've got two full-time jobs. I'm working on various different creative projects. I'm a very busy guy, so I'm not necessarily Mr. YouTube guy spending all of his time making video essays, etc., etc. You know, I'm a, I'm a busy person, uh, working hard to follow my dreams, and uh, there's this Jordan Peterson video that I've watched before that got recommended to me today, and I thought, man, that video was really, really stupid. You know what? I'm going to react to it and comment on it and tell you why it's uh, almost self-parody. So my general thoughts on Jordan Peterson is that when I first heard about the guy, uh, I you know listened to his Rogan interview, like the big one, and I thought, okay, he has a legitimate concern about free speech in an area that is nuanced, and I kind of liked him on first impression. And uh, his self-help advice is generally good. But as I started to read more of his work and uh, listen to interviews with him, I found him to just be a generally um, paranoid person in that he just has this extreme paranoia, basically like any leftist policy whatsoever. And not acknowledging like the wide spectrum and, you know, the difference between socialized medicine and locking up your citizens and lack of free speech. Like those are very you know, very wide differences in leftist ideology. And so like Norway and Sweden aren't hell holes where there's no freedom. Um and so I think the lumping in together of like any leftist policy ever automatically makes you Russia or Cuba, I find to be um silly and hyperbolic. And um you know, people who have seen his videos about uh, cleaning up your room, and then he has like a messy room behind him, I find that his critique of um, saying don't criticize power structures, instead get your own life in order, um, I agree with that to a degree. I think there are a number of people who just spend so much time complaining about other people, they don't take a look in the mirror and look at the flaws of themselves. So like, you know, me, I'm not necessarily happy with my place in life. I spent the last decade or so pursuing a music career that didn't necessarily go as well. And so I recognized I was doing something wrong, and I'm working on shifting that. I'm taking personal responsibility, you know, working two jobs, going after it every day, and, uh, you know, with with integrity, uh, you know, pay, paying off my, my debt, you know, living an honest and ethical life. And I think that's something that, you should strive to do, and you should try to get your life in order. I 100% agree with that, and you know, I think his critiques of, like, you know, trying to build your social status, I think there's validity to that. However, I find it to be a bit of a deflection, saying, like, hey, there's issues in society, but if you don't have your life perfectly in order, you can't address any societal issue, even if it's uh, an infrastructure issue and something that is perpetuating problems throughout society. Nobody has their life perfectly in order. That's just an impossibility, a fallacy. That doesn't happen. And so to say you should not criticize power structures because your life isn't perfectly in order, um, I find that to be a uh, silly way of just avoiding criticism of those power structures. I think there's room to do both. I think you should take personal responsibility, get your stuff together, live your best life, um, acknowledge that like maybe the you know the system might be stacked against you but you can spend all your time complaining about it or you can try to do something about it and i think it is the ethical duty of a member of society to try to better yourself but also the ethical duty of a member of society to try to better society in the ways that you can and so the ways that i've done that i've done uh, charity shows for you know cancer research and uh, for abused children, victims of child abuse, and we've raised money for that. Uh, when the tornado hit Nashville, uh, I helped clean up the wreckage after that. So I've done I've uh, fed and you know uh, housed the homeless at churches. So I do believe in giving back. I do believe in trying to address societal issues. So if you think, hey, there's this law that is adversely affecting people, then yeah, you should protest it. So um, I guess that makes me a Marxist uh, for just saying like, hey, there are some 
issues with institutions, maybe we should fix those issues instead of just acting like they're not a problem or like, oh, uh, you have $3,000 in credit card debt. I guess that means you can't criticize anything about structures ever. Like, no, everyone's got their own thing, you know. But uh, anyway, so Frozen's my favorite movie. And his criticisms of Frozen are so mind-blowingly dumb that they're, they're almost like if someone had told you that they were parodying Jordan Peterson with his criticism of Frozen. Like, I think it was a Jordan Peterson parody because he calls Frozen feminist propaganda, which um, is so absurd. I'd be like, oh, you had female characters who just, like, were strong and independent. I guess that's feminist propaganda. Just those people don't exist in real life. Um, that I find absurd. Um, and uh, also, it doesn't perfectly align with uh, the the tropes of the hero's journey. It goes off the beaten path, so therefore it's not good storytelling. Is just patently absurd. So I've got this video pulled up. I've got it on double speed because I want to get through this as fast as possible, but I'm going to listen to his critiques and just address them as they come up. Otherwise, it gets one-sided, like Frozen, which was an absolutely dismal and wretched movie. It was mythological. It was. Disney's pretty good at mythology, but Frozen was pure ideology. So it was very annoying to see that, because in most situations, the Disney movies are pretty good at balancing out the archetypes. So, and that's part of the reason they're so insanely popular. You know, they present an archetypal picture of the world. And the thing is, you say, well, you know, I don't have any religious beliefs. You might say that to yourself. It's like, fine, why do you watch Disney movies? What the hell do you think you're doing in the theater? You don't think that's a religious experience? It's just because you're completely clueless about what religious experiences are. You're watching a bunch of pictures. Like, they're drawings, you know, of things that aren't even real. And then you're just... I mean, yeah, so that, I mean, archetypes are popular for a reason, but not everything needs to perfectly fit inside an archetype to be good storytelling. That's just not a thing. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's, well, let's see if we actually get to a point that's... Just in there, like, embedded in there. It's got your imagination. So you say, well, I don't believe in any of that. So, yeah, right. So come on. You believe in it. Basically, yes, but it's, 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 there's a problem underneath that that's even a bit deeper. Because like, I think the dominant hierarchy is real, period, real. But it's not, it's, it's a weird structure because it's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like the, the example I gave earlier where there's the tunnel and the train going through it, the train keeps, at any moment, the train cars are full of different things. Well, dominant hierarchy is kind of like that. It's actually a dissipative structure. That's so a dissipative structure is like a, uh, you know, when you let the water go out of a drain and you get that coil, that funnel? Well, is that a thing? Well, it's a constant across a series of transformations. It's a dissipative structure. And the physicist Schrodinger regarded people as dissipative structures. So, because our, our, our structure isn't constant. Like, I don't know, you probably replaced every cell in your body, roughly speaking, or at least the constituent elements of every cell, you know, two or three times since you've been alive. But there you are. So you're like this thing that's a permanent structure in a flux. And the dominant hierarchy is sort of like that. Because the constituent elements of it keep changing. But its existence is, its existence is there. And so I don't exactly know what to make of a category like that, except that I'm certainly going to say that it's real. Or if you don't like that, I can say, I don't care if it's real because all of you act as if there's nothing that's more real than that. So that'll do for me. Because, you know, that brings up another question. How do you know what someone regards as real? And one answer is, well, you listen to what they say. It's like, uh, no, you watch what they do. That's a much more accurate guide to who they are. Because what do they know about who they are? They've got a vague model of who they are, and it's usually hyper-tilted towards banality and conformity and self-protection and deceit and all sorts of things. Well, that, that, like a hurricane is a dissipative structure, so that, you know, that's a reasonable analogy. And the spirit is often likened to the wind. So, so any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Oh, it's an appalling ideology because the people who created it had the idea about what it should be before they made it. So it's propaganda. You can say exactly what Frozen is about. So it's propaganda. A, a truly mythologically based story, you can never fully say what it's about. Okay, so that is uh, the first point of just um, absolute stupidity. Um, I mean, okay, so what is the story of Gilgamesh about? The futility of seeking immortality. Whoa, that's a myth. I summarized it in a sentence. I was able to do it. That easy. So, yes, you can summarize uh, the moral to the story quite simply. And to act like um, stories having morals and messages means that they're automatically propaganda is is patently absurd uh, for a guy who likes reading Ayn Rand. Uh, so that is uh, just pure absurdity. Stories are able to have messages, morals, and themes. That's why we're able to relate to them. Now, there can be nuance and gray area, and there can be multiple themes to a work of fiction, and that can make a work of fiction better. But to act like, uh, oh, let me, uh, oh, it's cutting off half his face. You know what, whatever, I don't care. Um, to act like, oh, I lost my train of thought because I, I got distracted with the face. You know, uh, but, yeah, so to act like there's, uh, this is unscripted, as you can tell. 
to say that because a story has a message, it's not a good story is the worst storytelling critique I've ever heard. You can just talk about it forever and ever and ever and ever. So it's, it's a wellspring of meaning. So. Oh, sure they are. Of course that's what they're doing. Oh, yeah, it's calculated marketing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It was hyper-politically correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't need men. And, you know, God, give me a break. You know, just because you need men doesn't mean you have to like them. Okay. So the, uh, there is an interview that he also did with, uh, with Time Magazine about this, which I pulled up here. And uh, he... Uh, I'm going to read some of it. Let's see here. No, not just a lovely story about sisterhood. No, afraid not. You know you don't spend tens of millions of dollars on a carefully crafted narrative that's just a lovely story unless that's what you're trying to tell. No, Disney has like cra spent millions of dollars telling simple stories that are endearing. Like, they've done that. That isn't what the people who made Frozen were trying to tell, not in my estimation. Aren't, uh, Time Magazine asks, aren't we allowed to make up new stories not for political reasons? Let's see. So, basically, one of the critiques he has is that the, the women are saved by each other rather than saved by a man, and that is uh, feminist propaganda. Uh, the interviewer was arguing that, uh, hey, isn't that just like a story about familial bond and isn't that a story worth telling? And he said, well, you know, what about True Love's Kiss? The, the thing is, the movie still ends w with um, Anna in a relationship with Kristoff. Like, she still gets the guy. That still happens. It just goes to show that they, there's balance to life and you can still have a relationship, but also family is important, which is something that is, I think, a reasonable thing to do in a movie. And also, the thing about tropes is that subverting them can make for interesting storytelling. Uh, yeah, just pure absurdity. Let's keep going. Yeah, so, so, I mean, I thought a lot about the difference between propaganda and art. So, art's actually a process rather than an end product. And with any luck, if you have a piece of art, the process is embedded in the byproduct. And so it reflects the process when you bring it into your house. And so it's an active, it's a, it's a crystallized act of exploration. And the real artist doesn't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They're exploring. I can, I can recommend a film. There's a film made of Picasso in about 1950. Okay, so to be, so his argument is that you as an artist need to not know what your art is going to be like at the end of it or have a goal in mind because otherwise then you're making propaganda. I think is, is very silly. To say that, like, Animal Farm is not a work of art because George Orwell had an idea about what he wanted to say with the work, or 1984 is not a work of art because it has a message and a meaning, I mean, yes, propaganda is a thing. But to say any art that, like, you, like, have a plan for or is guided is propaganda, and that the only way to make art is if you don't know what you're doing and you're just guided by the muse, do you know how many artists are out there and how different the methodology for creating art is like th everyone has their different approaches some people do just go with the muse and just like whatever comes out comes out and some people have like a rigid plan and they're like very meticulous and perfectionist with their vision so i also find that to be a silly argument and it was a black and white film and it was actually a film of him making a painting and he painted it on glass so you can see what he was doing. It's really quite fascinating because you can see that he's playing. He sketches it in and then he rubs it out. So he sketches it in again and he rubs it out and he sketches over here. It's like there's a real dynamism about it. He doesn't plan it out to begin with. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that as an artistic endeavor too. But Picasso was trying to explore and understand. And you know, I don't know what you know about cubism, but cubism, it's a strange thing. But what he was doing with his cubism was to try to show you that you only see things from one perspective, but that things exist in multiple perspectives. So, you know, a cubist painting is your face this way and your face this way at the same time. And so you could say, well, is that a more accurate way of, of representing a person than just the standard portrait? And Picasso would say, well, in some ways, definitely, because it captures the transformative element rather than the static element. And so someone who's a true artist doesn't have a political message. That's funny because my house is full of ideological propaganda from the Soviet Union. It's just packed full of it. And it's so interesting to, to watch these artifacts because a lot of them were, they're socialist. Okay, so artists can have uh, political messages. Like, that is a va valid form of artistic expression. Um, and I really think what it comes down to is that if Peterson's intense fear of the Soviet Union and the Soviet ideology clouds his view on 
much more benign things. And that's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention to warning signs and signals, and there are things that can lead up to that, but um, Frozen just being like, hey, sometimes you should put the importance of your own flesh and blood over relationships um, is, I don't think that's necessarily feminist propaganda. Realist, although mostly they're impressionist, really. It's so interesting to watch them because in the painting themselves, there's a war that you can perceive. And the war is a lot of the people who made these paintings were incredibly talented, really, really skilled because the Russians kept their, their formal academies open. So the Russians can really paint impressionism. It's remarkable. But their talents were encapsulated within this but mostly Stalinist ideology. And so in each canvas, there's this war between the ideological message and the artistic message. And what's so cool is the farther we get away from the Soviet Union, the more the art wins. Because in 300 years, there isn't going to be a shred left of that ideology. And all that will be left of the paintings is the art. So part of the reason that people are so attracted to art is because the artist actually manifests identity with the process of transformation. And so that's why the artist is a cultural hero. That's also why every nihilist worth his salt wants to be an artist. Like, who are you? Or, what do you say? I'm a nihilist? No, I'm an artist. It's like, no, you're not, but I can see why you want to be. Right, right. Yeah, just because you're a failure doesn't mean you're an artist. <laughs> Well, I think it depends on who you are. Like, it's really interesting to me, but I'm really interested in that. You know, and I'm also interested in the way that ideologies co-opt more fundamental processes to, to and harness their energy as a, as a rational and motivating force. And so for me, these pieces of art, propaganda, are extremely interesting. I mean, it's very interesting to be surrounded by them because I can see this war going on all the time. So it's very cool. And the art's winning, as far as I can tell. So that's very interesting. Because they were pure propaganda, many of them, when I bought them. But it's getting farther and farther away from the Soviet Union. So the more archetypal elements are coming to the forefront. So. I think it would depend on the skill of the artist. You know, and some of these artists are incredibly skilled. So to the degree that there are, there's genuine artistic merit in the painting, regardless of its constraint, that can manifest itself as value. All right, so there you go. So that was uh, Jordan Peterson uh, explaining why Frozen was so incredibly terrible. So just, uh, just to recap, the reason that Frozen is terrible, terrible propaganda is because let me get let me get a pause on on Jordan so this looks a little bit better. All sorts of things. All right. So Frozen is terrible feminist propaganda because it doesn't follow archetypes. And the woman doesn't end up with the man in the end, except she does. Um, like. This is the kind of stuff that, like, people make fun of Jordan Peterson fans for. <laughs> like, like this is this is an absurd, absurd argument. I mean, he has some good self-help tips, but politically he is, I'm just going to say, frankly, very, very silly. Um, overly paranoid. Um, that's not to say there isn't, like, legitimate criticism of, like, far leftist regimes. But to then say, well, then you can't, you know... Criticize any of the power structures that you know on the conservative side is 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 dumb. There's this criticism to be leveled towards the left. There's criticism to be leveled towards the right. There are legitimate critiques you can make of Frozen from a storytelling perspective. He doesn't really make those. He just doesn't like that it starred girls, and that the girls didn't need to be saved by a boy. Therefore, it's propaganda. Um. Bro, shouldn't you like people picking themselves up by their bootstraps, not waiting for someone else to say them, and just taking action into their own hands? Uh, yeah, so, like I said, um, there will be those who will criticize me as like, oh, who are you? You're not successful, so how do you criticize Jordan Peterson? Look, I'm, I'm busy doing my own thing, living my own life, uh, working on my own stuff. But I'm going to, you know, take... A quick 20 minutes out of my day to say, yo, dog, your argument is dumb. Um, so I can't wait for all the Jordan Peterson fans to uh, attack me as being unreasonable, even though I am a centrist arguing for centrism. Also arguing for personal responsibility and arguing that, like, hey, some power structures are worthy of criticism. You know, like the Soviet Union power structure. Oh. Anyway, that's the video. Uh, I'm going to go back and uh, get some hours in at that second job because I'm picking myself up by my bootstraps. Y'all have a good one. Can't wait to read the comments. I'm sure they won't be toxic. Bye!